We hope that the restraint of population growth can come about through voluntary means. But if it does not, involuntary methods will be used. Dr. Donald Minkler, 1972. Donald Minkler was the president of the American Association of Planned Parenthood Physicians and a member of the board of directors of Planned Parenthood Federation of America. Like many of those in the eugenics movement, he understood that their plans would not always be voluntarily adopted and that the use of governmental coercion or even force might one day be necessary. The idea of forced eugenics was not something that suddenly developed in the 1970s. In a 1929 speech, American eugenicist Samuel Holmes had proposed that mandatory birth control should be used as a tool to eliminate what he called the menace to the white race that had been created by increases in black population. His solution was to have a quota system in which the right to have a child would be controlled by the government and determined by race. At the time, Holmes was on the National Council of the American Birth Control League, which would later become known as Planned Parenthood. Then, in 1936, eugenicist Julian Huxley proposed that the genetically inferior classes could be made to have fewer children if they were denied easy access to welfare. Another part of this proposal was that medical care to these same people should be restricted in order to reduce the survival rates of the children they did have. He also called for the forced sterilization of anyone who was unemployed beyond a certain length of time. Huxley was later honored by Planned Parenthood and was a featured speaker at one of their annual conventions. The reality is that the views of people like Samuel Holmes and Julian Huxley were never uncommon within the American eugenics community. In 1969, a professor at the University of California, Dr. Garrett Hardin, called it insanity to rely on volunteerism to control population. Hardin was a member of the American Eugenics Society and an outspoken advocate of government-enforced birth control, saying that citizens should be willing to give up their right to breed for the betterment of society. In 1980, he was given Planned Parenthood's highest national award. He and his wife would later kill themselves in a joint suicide pact. There were, of course, some within the eugenics movement who were uncomfortable with the idea of using force, and they would often express their reservations about it in public. But when pressed, virtually none of them would rule it out, including Planned Parenthood founder Margaret Sanger. I consider that the world and almost our civilization for the next 25 years is going to depend upon a simple, cheap, safe contraceptive to be used in poverty-stricken slums, jungles, and among the most ignorant people. Even this will not be sufficient, because I believe that now, immediately, there should be national sterilization for certain dysgenic types of our population who are being encouraged to breed and would die out were the government not feeding them. Margaret Sanger, 1950. This was written by Sanger in a personal letter to Catherine Dexter McCormick, McCormick was an heir to the international harvester fortune and would later use part of her immense wealth to fund the development of the birth control pill. In 1966, an example of the coercive power of state eugenics laws was seen in Maryland when three young mothers applied for welfare benefits. All three were arrested for child neglect, even though the authorities never claimed to have any evidence of abuse or neglect. Instead, the women were held under a state law which stated that simply being unmarried and pregnant was child neglect. The judge in this case warned the women that if they ever became pregnant again, the state would take custody of all their children. Officials in Prince George's County, where the arrest took place, stated that welfare recipients could avoid being prosecuted under this law by submitting to state-sponsored birth control education. 